Neil Armstrong, the first man on the moon, said that the thing he feared the most about the Apollo 11 mission was a solar flare. This solar weather is as much an issue for the upcoming Artemis program in 2024 as it was for the Apollo missions. And in fact, in August 1972, between Apollo 16 and 17, one of the most powerful and deadliest solar flares of the space age occurred. So how did they prepare for this back in the Apollo days and how much better prepared are we for it today? This video is sponsored by Magellan TV. Magellan is a new documentary streaming service run by filmmakers that have a passion for their work. Magellan believes that spreading knowledge about human endeavors is key, and their mission is to tell great stories and show how we got to where we are today. Magellan has over 3,000 documentaries available, with more being added all the time, with a wide selection of those being in 4K for no extra cost and you can also stream them directly to your smartphone or tablet wherever you are. For our video today, we're looking at solar particle events and the Apollo program. So I think you'll like Magellan's hour-long moonshots inside the Lost Apollo archives, which covers from Apollo 1 to Apollo 17, with some great quality rare archive footage. Well worth it if you're a fan of the Apollo programs. You can watch this and many more by getting your one month free trial by using the link of a special offer right at the top of the description below. And I'm sure you'll enjoy watching Michelle and TV as much as I have. Just as we've seen how unpredictable and violent the weather here on Earth can be, space is actually no different. Although we now know much more about its main cause, the sun, than we did 50 plus years ago. And this gives us hope for better predictions but some of the most dangerous and damaging events can occur randomly and without warning. The first time that we had an inkling that the sun was doing something other than providing us with just heat and light came in 1852 when the British astronomer Edward Sabine showed that there was a connection between magnetic storms here on Earth with increased auroral activity and the appearance of sunspots. And in 1859, Richard Carrington connected the now so-called Carrington event, an extremely large magnetic storm, with a solar flare near sunspots he had observed the day before. During World War II in 1942, the use of radio and radar was found to be affected by extreme amounts of static and noise when a large solar flare occurred. Spool on a few years to 1957, the International Geophysical Year, and the first US satellite, Explorer 1, discovered belts of radiation in the form of charged particles trapped by the Earth's magnetic field, which we now call the Van Allen belts, after the project leader James Van Allen. All this was revealing space to be far from just a vacuum where nothing much happened. Charged particles continuously stream from the sun in what we now call the solar wind, something which was first observed and measured by the Soviet satellite Luna 1 in 1959. Whilst the solar wind is a constant stream flowing from the sun, from over 150 years of solar observations, we now know the sun goes through phases approximately every 11 years when its magnetic field flips and there is an increase in sunspots and solar flares, which can eject billions of tons of charged particles into space at high speed. And it's just a matter of luck whether these end up heading in our direction. These ionizing particles can damage our DNA, leading to cancer or even rip our biological cells apart and damage or destroy delicate electronics and computer chips, which is why they are of so much concern. So one would think that sending missions during the solar low periods would be the safest option, but there is another type of galactic radiation that also occurs. These are the galactic cosmic rays or GSRs, very high energy particles created by events such as supernovas or neutron stars, thousands or even millions of light years away that can be many orders of magnitude greater than anything created by our sun. These are mostly bare nuclei, atoms stripped of their electron shells and high energy protons traveling at very nearly the speed of light 
giving them the energy to penetrate even heavily shielded spacecraft and cause damage to the crew and or electronics inside. So when the sun is in a solar low period, it might well be quieter and more predictable, but its weaker activity also weakens its magnetic field, allowing these high energy cosmic intruders to more easily enter the inner solar system. We here on Earth are protected by the Earth's magnetic field and atmosphere. The magnetic field captures and deflects charged particles to the polar regions, creating the northern and southern auroras, whilst the atmosphere provides us with about 100 kilometers of atmospheric gas of varying densities, which absorb most of the higher energy galactic cosmic rays, X rays, and ultraviolet radiation. But once you leave the protection of the Earth, such as when we go to the moon, we are exposed to the full force of these types of radiation. Whilst we can use the regular cycles to look for periods of least solar activity, we've discovered that the most extreme events like the Carrington event and the August 1972 event, which pose a lethal threat to space missions, are random and can occur out of the blue even in solar low periods. However, from looking at 150 years of solar observations, we found that they tend to occur later on in odd numbered solar cycles if and when they do actually appear. This is what concerned Neil Armstrong during the Apollo 11 mission, as it took place during a solar high period where solar flares are more common and intense. This was a compromise between the political imperative to put a man on the moon by the end of a decade to beat the Soviets and the risk to the astronauts from the increased solar activity. But as we have seen, it also meant that the sun's stronger magnetic field would also lessen the more damaging GSRs. The most dangerous part of the mission was the moonwalk, as there is only a very weak magnetic field on the moon to deflect any incoming particles and essentially no atmosphere to absorb them. So their only protection was their A7L pressure suits. Although these had been used on missions before, it would be the first time they had been used on the moon's surface. Even though they had been modelled as accurately as possible at the time, there was no way here on Earth to simulate both the deep vacuum, the wide temperature swings from minus 127 C in the shade to plus 125 C in direct sunlight, sharp rocks on the surface, and the one-sixth gravity all at the same time. They also offered little in the way of radiation protection from the high energy particles from a large solar flare or GSRs. In fact, all the Apollo missions were gambling that an extreme particle event wouldn't happen during their transit or time on the moon. And luckily, none of them were caught out, but it was just a matter of fortuitous timing. On the 4th of August, 1972, about midway between the safe return of Apollo 16 in April and the launch of Apollo 17 in December, what would become the largest solar storm of the space age occurred, creating 63 normal solar flares and four X-class solar flares whilst it was facing the Earth. This storm was so strong that it caused widespread disruption of the power and communications grid across the US. It also damaged satellites as the Earth's magnetosphere was severely constricted by the buffeting from the coronal cloud and increased solar wind, which exposed many of them to high energy bombardment, causing two years worth of wear to the solar panels in just a few days. And it also caused the accidental detonation of up to 4,000 US naval magnetic mines off the coast of North Vietnam. It was also the fastest transit time from the sun to the earth for a coronal cloud ever recorded at just 14.6 hours. It's been calculated that if this had occurred whilst a crew had been outside of a lander and on the surface of the moon, they would have been exposed to a radiation dose of 10 gray. That's 10 times the normal human dosage of radiation expected in a lifetime. Inside the lander would have offered only marginally more protection as it was thin skinned compared to the command module. This would have been a lethal dose that would not only have required an emergency return to Earth while suffering acute radiation sickness, but also a bone marrow transplant when they arrived back to save their lives. 
We here on Earth would have seen the flare and would have known that a particle event was on its way and would have been able to give them a warning to get back to the command module as soon as possible. But as we didn't have the sun monitoring satellites that we have now, we wouldn't have known how quickly it was traveling. Back in the more heavily shielded command module, the aluminium skin would have reduced the exposure to about one tenth of that compared to their spacesuits on the surface. That would still give them sickness and nausea, but they would have probably have avoided the bone marrow transplant when they got back. But either of these scenarios would have given them a much greater chance of cancer in later years. Now, all the conspiracy theorists out there will no doubt point out, well, how did they avoid the deadly Van Allen radiation belt? Well, they didn't. They flew through the least dense areas and only for a few hours. That and the attenuation provided by the command module shielding meant that they were exposed to a moderate dose for a short period of time. That and the days between the outgoing belt transition and the return belt transition gave their bodies more time to recover. In fact, when the dosometers that the crews wore during all of the Apollo missions were checked afterwards, they'd receive much less than the yearly limit of 5 rem set for radiation workers. Radiation still poses a major problem for any future missions outside of the Earth's protective envelope. The use of new lightweight and yet more effective high hydrogen content shielding materials means that new spacecraft are safer than those of the Apollo era, but it's still a compromise between the extra shielding needed and the weight it adds to the launch vehicle. For future spacecraft that will be built in space where launch weights are not an issue, active shielding using superconducting electromagnets to create an artificial magnetic field around the craft to deflect charged particles could well be used. Another extremely good, simple and cheap radiation shield is water due to its very high hydrogen content. Each 7 centimeters of water reduces ionizing radiation by half, putting a 1 meter thick water envelope around the crew quarters would provide enough shielding to reduce even the most extreme particle events to the equivalent of less than background radiation levels here on Earth. The problem with this is that it adds a huge amount of mass, which then greatly increases the amount of fuel required to go anywhere even using gravity assist for long journeys. So until such time that we can build this type of spacecraft in space using space source materials and fuels, we'll just have to be a bit more creative. It's been suggested that if we really want to protect our future crews during the transit to and from any permanent moon bases, we should have more solar monitoring satellites to give more accurate warnings and an orbiting safe haven where crews can stop off to weather out any high energy particle events that may occur. On the moon, bases built either in caves or with thick regolith formed walls will protect the crews on the surface. But further research into the sun is probably our best hope. Programs like the Birmingham Solar Oscillation Network or BISON, which has been running for over 30 years now, are giving us a view of the sun's interior. Using this helioseismology data, we've been able to see structural changes that occurred under the surface in the run up to the most recent solar cycle. And this may well lead to better prediction of the more dangerous solar storms, maybe at some point in the future. So I hope you enjoyed the video. And if you did, then please thumbs up, subscribe, click the bell notification and share. And as always, I'd like to say a big thank you to all of our excellent patrons out there for their ongoing support.